So if I move too far to one side, right, you know, you have to flail your hands and kind of go side to the ocean, right? <laughs> so, uh, we uh, were kind of working through our mishmash of chapters 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and everything else, basically, right? The, the rest of the kitchen sink, right, is what it is. Um, what is it next? When's the exam? Next week? Next week. All right. Good stuff. So let me talk really, really fast and so that I can add a lot more stuff into the exam. And it's really just kind of, right? Now, just really, really teach you guys a lesson. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> really, really teach you guys a lesson about it all, right? I'm just kidding. There's a lot of information on this next exam, all right? There's a lot of reactions. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of concepts. There's a lot of thoughts. There's a lot of everything, okay? There's lots of important things, okay? I don't probably have to tell you that, you know, uh, mention that to you guys. I think you guys figured it out, right? But the point being is um, I hope you guys have been keeping up with this, uh, you know, kind of the daily, the daily discipline of reading through your organic stuff, right? You're starting to look through your checklist of things, right? Starting to, starting to make whatever notes you guys need to when you guys are going through and um, doing your reactions, okay? Extremely important. Where we had ended up is one of these ideas that's gonna come up over and over and over. And that's the idea of selectivity, right? We've learned a lot of reactions where a strong acid can affect some kind of transformation, right? We've learned where HBr can react with an alkene. We've learned where HBr can react with an alcohol. Right, we've learned different acid-base reactions, different acid-base steps, right? And so now the thought has to become, well, everything we've done so far is we have a functional group and a reagent, but the world doesn't work that way, right? Molecules have multiple functional groups. There's different reactions that can happen. And so if we want to affect one of these transformations, right? whether to add the BR here or to add the BR there, then we have to start to be clever about how we put together our different reagents. That's the whole point. Got it? So we're gonna have to think about, okay, how can I make only that reaction happen? That's the idea, all right? So we'll come back to this idea here, but I want you guys to start to pay attention to what functional groups are present and what reagents are present. Okay, and what reactions can work with multiple functional groups or not. Does that make sense? Okie dokie. So, last time also, we learned about our, um, <clears throat> our acid-catalyzed dehydration. So we have our strong acid, we elevate the temperature to boil off some water, okay? and we take an alcohol all the way down into an alkene. Got it? What's the problem with this reaction though? Or maybe one of the many problems. Yep? You take a sigma bond and you make it a pi bond? Well, yes, right? That is a, uh, let's say the problem of how can you get this reaction to go? Right? That's certainly something important to pay attention to, right? We're trading a carbon-oxygen bond which is a very strong bond for a carbon-carbon double bond, which is, right? I mean, it's okay. It's not that it's more or less stable. It's just there's a trade in energy, right? What is H2SO4? Strong acid. Do you think it's selective towards alcohols? No, right? So that's the problem here. Sulfuric acid is going to do a lot of different transformations. This is just one of them. The other thing is, what happens as we elevate temperature? Um, not necessarily, well, maybe, yeah, but, maybe, well, what do you mean by that? Um, the reaction with the molecules increases. What does that mean? Um, the, fast, the reaction goes faster. What reaction? Every reaction goes faster. Got it? 
So do you think this is the only product that can get formed here? No. Okay. So there is a problem where the, the more you increase temperature, the more garbage starts to happen. Okay. Let me put it this way. If I wanted to make this in the lab, this is the last way that I would go about and do it. Okay. It's really not that good of a method. It's cheap. It's pretty easy. But it makes a giant mess. And I'm lazy. I don't want to clean up all that mess. Right. So we, we try to come up with a, let's say, a more clever way of doing it, a cleaner way of doing it, okay? Okay, so let's see what you guys can think of. Let's say that there's a giant uh, sulfuric acid shortage on the planet due to, um, I don't know, some kind of global pandemic or whatever, just to think of an idea. How could we do that without sulfuric acid? Don't worry though guys, there's plenty of sulfuric acid still. I just don't want you guys to get stressed. <laughs> That's what I'm not saying, don't use sulfuric acid. Don't use any acid in fact. Well, go th actually go through and think and do what you're thinking. I think I know what you're saying. What's always the most important thing you guys can do? Hmm? Yeah, think, right? Assess what's going on. What do we have to do for this transformation? We know we have to do an elimination along the way, right? How do you guys know that you have to do an elimination? What's our product going to end up with? Our final product, I should say. An alkene, right? How many ways do we have of making an alkene? Well, we've got two, right? An E1 or an E2. Got it. How do we know that we are going to likely do an E2? Well, you can do whatever you want to, right? I'm giving you guys a open toolbox to use whatever we need to, except for sulfuric acid, right? So a limited toolbox, so to speak. Yeah, we don't have a um, tertiary uh, leaving group. We don't have any. We don't have any tertiary positions, right? So we're likely going to be doing E two. Do everybody follow this line of thought here? Because if I give you guys a blank slate, right, the first thing you need to do is start to narrow down your choices. 
your choices are always typically going to come down to four things, right? Right. What are those four things? Uh, tacos, burritos, enchilada. <laughs> uh, I don't know. What else? No. What are your four things? <laughs> Got it, right? That's what we've been learning, right? So we should probably be narrowing things down to a, a set of those four reactions, right? Here we assess that we're doing elimination, so we know, right? We know that we have to do an E1 or an E2 along the way, and we said, well, we don't have any tertiary positions or tertiary leaving groups, so likely we're going to be doing E2. Everyone catch that? Everyone catch that? What am I asking you guys to do? The same thing you have been doing, right? That's all. Going through your checklist, thinking about what your checklist means, right? Assessing what we have. Not saying it's easy, okay? I'm just saying that's the line of thought here, right? Now, if we want to do an E2, what do we need? We need a strong base. Well, it's good. We're given, we can use whatever we want. Right? So we can use whatever strong base we want. What else do we need? A good leaving group. Okay. Do we have a good leaving group? No. So what do you think our first step is? To make a good leaving group. Got it? Okay. So step one, turn the alcohol into a good leaving group. Do it. See what you guys come up with. Show me the reaction. You're right, but show me how it's done.
question also is what do we know are the weak moves? Like what are the ones that we see most commonly? How can we do that transformation, that kind of thing? Mm. That's going to be protonated water? No. No. <laughs> Yeah, not quite. Okay. Can you think of another one? Ooh, be careful. Yeah. You have the right idea, but the major wrong reagent there. And what would your product be for that? You know you need a strong base, but that one remember to be a little bit different. This plus that is not going to make that. This plus that is going to make something else. Did you did. Don't, don't call me on the video. I did. Ma'am, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, step one we need to make a good leaving loop, right? What are good leaving groups? We really only know two of them. What are they? Morgan, what's the one that you used? Uh, Cosylates. Okay, cosylates. Fantastic leaving groups, right? Excellent leaving groups. Uh, Cole, I think you had a different one. What did you use? Yeah, water. How did you make water though? What did you add into this to turn it in? Hydrogen. And what's the reagent? What's the leaving group? <laughs> what did you turn the alcohol into? Is what I'm asking. The first step. I don't know what I would call it. It's two H's and the other one to put the molecules in. Oh, you didn't finish it up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were, I thought you were on the right track. Uh, you, you, you are. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. You're on the right track, but you didn't quite finish it up. Okay. So tosylates are one good set of leaving groups. What are our other big set of leaving groups that we've seen all the time? Our halogens, right? Got it? So what I'm saying, you've got to make a good leaving group. How many options do you have? Two. Make a tosylate or make a halogen. Got it? Chemistry is easy. Two choices, right? Always two choices. So, how can I turn an alcohol into a tosylate? So let's just follow a blue arrow here, right, so to speak. So I put my tosyl chloride. Okay, with my pyridine. And I can make my tosylate group, okay. I could turn this into a haline by the addition of HBr, right? Good? So one of those is a better method. In this case, neither, right? Doesn't really make a difference. Got to make a good leaving group. Once we have a good leaving group, then we said that we have to um, do an elimination, an E2. So, how can we do an E2? Using whatever your heart's desire. Favorite base. Nobody, nobody's got a favorite base. No, no, Dr. H. Huh? Yeah, yeah, pick a better one then. Book four? Not, I actually took a different process for making the alkene. Um, okay, hang on, hang on to that thought for just a second. Though. Okay. okay. I want to hear it, but hang on to it for just a second. Do you guys get what I'm asking you here? How do I set up something to do an E2 reaction? That's what I'm asking. 
Okay, we've got secondary leaving groups. That's good. They're unhindered. That's good. What else do we need to do in E2? Strong base. What are our strong bases? What makes that a strong base? Um, the fact that it has a uh, localized charge on the oxygen. Okay, so we need an oxygen with a localized negative charge, right? What's the most common one that we've seen? Hmm? Mm. All right, this is one that we've never seen before, so you might have to take notes on it. Very obscure. Okay. You guys catch what we're doing here? I'm asking you guys to think and use what you guys know, right? Otherwise, we're just going to get these habits of if this, then that, right? You know, this kind of. What's the word I'm looking for here? This cued, cued response. I need you guys to think about how we can start to string things together. Okay. Cole, you said you had a different thought. Yeah, for, let's see. How can I describe this? Um, so I made, HCl, I put a hydrogen on. Yeah, you can't isolate that. That's not going to just exist, right? You didn't do that. No, you did, but did we stop it? Could you isolate that in your reaction? No. Okay. Remember, each one of these steps gets us a product that is stable and you can get out. You're really not going to be able to isolate those charged species. Right? That's an intermediate for us, right? You're doing the same thing that you'd end up doing here, right? Because you, what you did is HCl at the beginning, and you'd instead of a bromine, you'd put a, 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 a chlorine there instead, right? Good. Let's, um, change tactics or change ideas here for a second. Change thoughts. this reaction. So, what do we have? What type of reaction are we doing here? Is it um, substitution? Mm, not substituting, right? Got an alkene. We get rid of the alkene. What's it called when we make out? Yeah, what's up? Is it you? No, one. What's it called when we make an alkene? What types of reactions are those? Those are our eliminations, 
right? When we make an alkene, we eliminate things. What's the opposite of eliminating something? Adding it, right? So what type of reaction is this then? Addition. Remember, those are some of the first ones we dealt with, right? So we've got basically five reactions that we've learned, right? We started, we learned our additions, and then we learned our SN1, SN2, E1, E2, right? Those are the five reactions. So here we have to add things. What did we add? You add the uh, hydroxide. And? Uh, the one hydrogen. So I added an OH and an H. You guys with me on this one? Everybody with me on that? It's important. I added an H on one side and an OH on the other. Hmm. So we need some source of something called HOH. Maybe uh, H2O, I guess it would come down to, right? Yeah. So here we'd be doing an, a hydration reaction, like we're adding water to something. Now, if you just put water in with an alkene, guess what's going to happen? Nothing, right? So we need something to get this going, a little bit of oomph. Hmm, what could we add to a reaction to get it to initiate it, maybe? Maybe some kind of catalyst, right? Now, we're going to add this rare catalyst. You guys ready? It's called an acid. I know. Shock. So what we're going to do here is an acid catalyzed hydration, okay? So an acid catalyzed hydration. I'm going to show you how it looks and you guys are going to tell me what the mechanism is. You got it? Okay, so we're going to use this rare acid called sulfuric, okay? And it's going to be there in a catalytic amount. So we have a bucket of water, we add our alkene into the bucket of water, we add a couple drops of our sulfuric acid to it. Show me the mechanism. Let's see what you guys come up with. What are some of the things we know about how chemistry works? What are some of the Dr. H's rules for success, if you want to call them that? Nobody wants to call them that, but. <laughs> what 
we know? If we see a strong acid, right? Where is it typically going to be used? In the first step, right? I let you guys know that this is a catalytic amount of acid, and we're putting this into a bucket of water. So what happens as soon as you put a strong acid into water? It dissociates. I also told you this is a catalyst, which means what? It works at the it's there at the beginning and it has to get reformed at the end. Got it? So that's your steps to your mechanism. Dissociate your acid. Make your acid react with your alkene and then regen your catalyst. Got it? Let's see what you guys come up with. Acid catalyzed hydration. This is basically your salt, right? Right, so how do you make that? So how do you make that? We're going to actually talk about that not too long from now, but so <laughs> this just showed this from reaching out to grab that. And just like um, This, 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 there's an arrow from here to there. So just like a normal arrow. Right? saying this in a, a shaming way. I'm just, I, I need you guys to start paying attention is what all I'm asking, right? Strong acid in water, the first thing that's gonna happen is it dissociates, okay? happening here, right? Acid reacting with the solvent, right? Water or solvent. Have we seen a step like this before? Yes, have you seen it multiple times before? Yes, this is a valid step to think about whenever we see acids in water. Yes. 
So now that we've generated this, now that's what's going to be doing our reaction, right? Behold, we have formed a carbocation. But you guys already knew that. Right? How could you guys have guessed that you would form a carbocation under these conditions? That's a clue for carbocation formation. more obvious clue, I would say. In the addition reaction we did, like, for the last exam, I remember the, the double bond reached out and they grabbed the hydrogen and then left, uh, left, left the positive charge on the more stable. So we did just this right here, right? Yep, that's a clue for when a carbocation is gonna form. I'm gonna give you guys, if I give you guys a mechanism that you've never seen before, What's a clue that a carbocation will probably form along the way? I'll give you a hint. It has to deal with the acid. So what's the clue? If you have a strong acid, guess what's probably going to form? A carbocation. Got it? Now how in the world does that make sense? What do acids do? They act like acids. How do acids act? What defines an acid? Hmm? Proton donor. What's a proton? An H with a what charge? Positive. Oh. What's a carbocation? A carbon with a positive. You got it? Under acidic conditions, you got a lot of pluses around. Got it? Things are acidic. You got a bunch of H3O plus floating around. Do you think a carbocation floating around is going to make a big difference? No. Guess when you won't see a carbocation form? When instead of seeing a bunch of pluses floating around, you have negatives floating around. You guys got it? So under basic conditions, right? When things are basic, you're not going to see carbocations form. Why? Well, basic conditions, things are negative. What's a carbocation? Positive. Okay? It won't last all that long. It won't really form, is the point that I'm making. If you've got a bunch of pluses, making another one's not a big deal. If you've got a bunch of negatives, making a negative's not that big a deal. You guys with me on this? Does that seem logical? Uh. <laughs> no, does that seem logical? Uh, yeah, okay, if I'm under positive conditions, right? If I'm under negative conditions, negatives, right? Can you guys finish up the mechanism from here? See what you guys come up with.
So this portion, right, regens our assets right there. And then it goes on to do the next. The cycle continues. Good? Anything different about this that we haven't seen before? It's a genuine question. It's not just one of these rhetorical questions. Is there anything different about these reactions that we haven't seen before? Step one, acid acts with our solvent, okay? Step one, strong acid acts like an acid, okay? Step two, alkene reacts with strong acid. Under strongly acidic conditions, we end up generating a carbocation. Once we generate a carbocation and it's at the stable position, we look for a nucleophile. Okay? And the nucleophile comes in. Good? Question. Oh, yeah. So in the in the previous example we had like water is a really good leaving group. Yeah. Um, but the distinction here is uh, what distinction? I think I know what you're asking. I'm to just making sure. Yeah, I guess I guess like my question is, um, when do we know when water acts like a good leaving group? When it does. <laughs> Here's a question that Freddie's asking. Like, hey, wait a minute. That's what he says. Whoops, I forgot. I forgot my positive charge. Okay, sorry about that. What Freddie's, what I think Freddie's asking, and if you are, just just pretend. Like I'm looking at that and I notice I have a good leaving group. Correct? Is that water? Is that a pronated alcohol? Could that be a leaving group? You bet. It's a great leaving group. So guess how it can behave? Got it? So what happens if it acts like a leaving group? If this leaves, where do we go? Back to here. Does that happen? You bet. Okay? It's the theory of microscopic reversibility. Every reaction we do can go back and forth. In fact, every reaction does go back and forth at a specific rate. Hmm. What's that idea come from? See, the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. That's equilibrium. That's equilibrium. Got it? So when we draw a mechanism, our mechanism tells us how we get from the beginning to the end. Every step in a mechanism progresses us towards our product. Every step is reversible. But if we go in reverse, then we just, that's what we already drew. Got it? So every step in a mechanism should progress you towards getting to the product. Okay? He's absolutely right. That's a fantastic leading group. And it can act like a leaving group, and I'll get back here. And then maybe water could come in and deprotonate that, and we're all the way back at where we started, right? That's theoretically possible, it certainly is, okay? It does happen, but it doesn't get us to what our answer is, right? You have a question? Yeah, so if we go back to my kind of carbocation, is the reason it doesn't get you is like the partial negative on the oxygen over the negative on the Ah, good question. No, there's a better reason. So the question that was asked is, so when I'm at my carbocation, right, that we had here, oops. The question he asked is, hey, wait a minute. I've got this. I've got negatives and positives, don't I? So why doesn't that come in and hit that carbocation? Hmm? What, what, what's attractive? Are negative attractive positives? Sure, is there anything inherently wrong about that adding to that carbocation? No. Damn it, right? So why doesn't it happen? 
The answer is it could, right? But why doesn't it? As often as water attacking it. What's water in this reaction? Waters are solvent. What's always around in the largest concentration? Solvent. The way you run this reaction, bucket of water, alkene, three drops of sulfuric acid. So how much of that minus is floating around? Basically nothing, right? So statistically, it's really never going to find that positive charge. Because for a reaction to happen, what has to happen? Two molecules have to find each other at the right space, at the right time, with the right momentum, at the right angle, right? For all, every, for all the stars to align, and then the two atoms can find each other. Finally, they're reunited in true love, right? Story as old as time. Carbocation, I'm like, <laughs> this way, fine. <laughs> All right, anyway, that's all that stupidity is I read. But <laughs> Do you guys get the point here? Is there anything inherently wrong with that happening? No. But statistically, it's really not going to happen. There's far more water around. These things are diluted, right? And so really, that can't happen. If you put that on an exam, am I going to take every point off? Yeah, I'm a jerk. Jeez, come on. No, right? But the point is, make sure you understand what's going on. I need you guys to not to... I need you guys to look at the T-Rex, right? You guys remember that stupid analogy I gave? Right? Just because the T-Rex off the screen doesn't mean it's not chasing you, right? It's still there, okay? So don't ignore, don't ignore the water. Don't ignore what the water is doing. Don't ignore what a solvent means, okay? I know what you guys are saying, that's fine. You find your negatives and you find your positives, that's fantastic. Again, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. Just think about what's going on in the reaction, okay? So hypothetically, if they were 50-50, that would be the main part? Probably not still, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Right? There's another reason for that also, right? That's just really an awful, awful nucleophile is what it comes down to. It's negative, sure, but it's so delocalized, it's not really going to want to go after that positive charge, to be honest. So, oh, how's everyone's confidence doing? <laughs> Don't worry. It's not at the ground floor yet. Okay, good. I, I, got, some, I got some time still today. <laughs> Let's see what else I can do. <laughs> the point I want to, I really, this is really the point that I want to make with this, right? The point I really want to get across to you guys is I could have just thrown this up there and said, you guys already know the answer. You guys have already seen what happens when strong acids react with solvent. You guys already know what it means to be a solvent. You guys already know addition reactions. You guys already know what happens when you have acids in their relationship to carbocations. You guys know all these things. You might not realize you know them, but that's why I'm telling you guys about this stuff. And that's why I keep trying to repeat it over and over and over again. Why? Because when I look at this, guess what I do? There's a strong acid. Strong acids are going to react in the first step. When I see a strong acid, I'm typically going to think about the formation of a carbocation. Okay? I check my solvents, I check leaving groups, I check functional groups, right? I check primary, secondary, tertiary positions, I do all these things. So what am I trying to get you guys to do? All that stuff, right? I need you guys to be little Dr. H's. I know, it's scary, I got it. <laughs> no, no, please God, no. <laughs> right? I need you guys to start looking at all these things. Because I am going to give you reactions that you guys have never explicitly seen, but guess what? Every one of those reactions is going to have in common. The individual parts that you guys have seen before. Okay, you're looking for your acids, you're looking for carbocations, you're looking for substitutions, eliminations. No matter what reaction I give you on the next exam, guess what? There's only five answers for it. Addition, SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Got it? You might have to do an acid base in there even, so I'm sorry, six. Only six answers for the next exam? That's easy, I'm just gonna put all six answers down for everything, right? <laughs> I found a way to scam the system. <laughs> but all joking aside, do you guys catch me on this one? I don't need you guys to memorize reactions. 
I need you guys to think about the steps in those reactions and where we see them over and over and over again. Draw the patterns out of things, okay? And that's what I really, really like about this textbook. They try and have you guys focus on patterns of things. If you guys follow along with that, it's gonna make your life a lot simpler, I promise. I promise, promise. Until we get to things that are kind of break the pattern. I know, but don't worry, we'll get there. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, we learned that <coughs> if I have something like this, right? And I try to do a, a hydration. Right. See if you guys can run through the mechanism real quick here then, see what you guys come up with. Dust maketh carbocation. Thank you. 
there's two types of sales responsibility. about the carbo cat options. What are some of the so? What are some of the clues that we know a carbocation had to form as part of our mechanism? Strong acid is present. What other clues can we see that a carbocation is formed? There's a tertiary that's next door to our starting functional group, right? Do you guys see that? The, the place that we put the alcohol is not one of the two carbons involved in the alkene. You guys catch what I'm saying with this? So we know there has to be some kind of rearrangement. What's the only intermediate that deals with rearrangements? Carbocations, right? So I'm trying to get you guys to assess things even if you already know the answers, right? How do I know that a rearrangement happens? Well, we, we check for our strong acids. We look, you know, is the group added on one of the carbons that were involved in the alkene to begin with? Right, these kind of things. Do I see a ring expansion that happened? Did I see a methyl group shift? Right, all these are clues that a carbocation had to be formed. Got it? Are those important clues to pay attention to? Yes. Are carbocations important? Yes. Are you guys going to forget to do shifts on the exam? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Some of you guys are. I'm just being honest. Okay. I'm telling you guys here so that you won't. Okay. You got about a week between now and the exam, right? It's plenty of time. Tattoo parlors are open. Okay. <laughs> just shift carbocations, right? You can make it in cool script, right? Okay. No. Guess you guys don't want those points, right? You're going to miss it then, right? The only answer is tattoos. Or just tattoo, you know, you could, chapter seven of Wade, third edition organic chemistry, right? Just tattoo all your exam answers on there, right? Sacrifices must be made, all right. <laughs> all right, so we're, you're with me on this. Now, let's, let's play a different game here. Let's say that I wanted, um, let, me, let me redraw this here. Let's say that the product that I need to cure cancer is this, okay? I need this right here. Then all the world will be good, right? Whatever that means. Can I make this product from this starting material under acidic conditions? No, right? What, what intermediate can't form for me to be able to form this product? I can't generate what? A carbocation along the way. Got it? If I form a carbocation, I am going to shift. Always. Always, always, always. So to be able to do this transformation, I have to avoid forming a carbocation. If I don't form a carbocation, guess what won't happen? A shift. Got it. So I have to put this alkene under different conditions that don't involve acids. That's all it takes. Except we will use an acid. What? Crap. <laughs> what in the world is this guy talking about? He's stupid. I mean, he just, just talks in circles. So what we're going to do, okay, 
is avoid the formation of our alcohols, okay? And to do this, we're gonna use some mercury, okay? Now there's some other stuff that's gonna go with it, okay? There's some other stuff that's gonna go with it, but what in the world is mercury? <coughs> Go ahead, whenever you guys got an idea. Yeah, right? So that, that's mercury in its elemental form is very cool. It's one of the only two naturally occurring uh, elements that are liquids at room temperature, right? There's only two of them. Everything else is a solid or a gas. Mercury is one of them. What's the other one? Hmm? Ooh, so very, very close. It's got a melting point of about uh, 30 degrees Celsius. When you hold it in your hand, it actually melts. It's really cool stuff. But actually, it is a solid at room temperature. But I like that idea. That's the only other liquid. Our good old buddy bromine is actually what it is, right? So you guys are going to dominate. This was actually a trivia question. I want my, my bar tab got covered because we knew this one. So <laughs> Finally, being a professor pays, <laughs> right? But it's bromine and it's mercury. Those are only two liquids at room temperature, right? But what else do we know about mercury? Well, it's a transition metal, right? Transition metals, it has a positive charge. You guys catch me on this one? It's mercury with a two plus charge is typically what we will see. Guess what's attracted to mercury with a two plus charge? electrons, right? <laughs> Anything that's positive is going to attract things uh, that are negative, right? So the way that mercury is going to act in this reaction, it's going to act like an acid. Not a Bronsted acid, it's going to act as a Lewis acid, okay? Lewis acids are electron pair acceptors, okay? Anything that accepts lone pairs is a Lewis acid, acid acceptor. Okay. H2SO4, HBr, HCl, all those things are Bronsted acids. Those are proton donors. When we're dealing with proton donors, Bronsted. When we're dealing with lone pairs moving, Lewis. Lewis acids are going to play pretty key roles for us in a lot of reactions. Okay, and this is going to be our first exam. Okay? Cool. That's it for today. We'll pick this up. We'll wrap it up on Friday there. Uh, tomorrow, Benzocaine-ish, right? Benzocaine reaction. We're only doing the synthesis part. We're not doing like they have the qualitative tests. I think it's like part B is what it is. So we're just going to do the synthesis and you guys are going to do the IR and the NMR, right? So what we've been doing all along. Sound good? Cool. See you guys tomorrow then. Oh, and uh, don't forget your first, if you guys haven't turned in your post lab for the caffeine, that will be due tomorrow. Okay?